Hey everybody, welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon, and uh, this here is part of uh, Crash Retrieval Week, and today we have a special guest, uh, and that is uh, Ryan Wood. You know, you know, Ryan has been the author of uh, a, a very uh, sought-after book called Magic Eyes Only, and that is exclusively dealing with uh, UFO crash retrievals. It's It's probably... Um, one of the most comprehensive modern books that has uh, covered the crash retrieval subject. And, uh, you know, it, he's done incredible work. And, uh, of course, his father as well, uh, Dr. Robert Wood. So uh, welcome, Ryan. Well, thanks, James. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, I look forward to our conversation and sharing it with the, the audience. Um, thanks for mentioning the book, uh, Magic Eyes Only. I'm working on a second edition. Um, which should be out, you know, in early January or so, just after Christmas for those that want to get to the next level. Um, the original book had uh, 74 UFO crash retrievals uh, from 1897, Aurora, Texas, to, to present. And the new book um, is going to be uh, 104 crash retrieval cases, Um and we went from 300 pages to 500 pages uh, in the book and updated a lots of different cases. So, and, and there's more uh, on my desk. It's just like I had to draw the line somewhere and say, uh, I need to stop and get this out and done rather than, you know, wait for, um, you know, to, to, to get even more. Um, yeah. It'll, it'll never be finished at that rate. Yeah, yeah exactly. At some point, you just got to put out what it is. And then if you want to revise it after that, you know, go for it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, magic eyes only. If you want to try to get a physical copy these days, good luck. Um, well, yeah, it's on, <laughs> so, it's on Amazon, but it's like $700 or something. And I and you're secretly holding the copy. <laughs> well, I, I have two copies on my shelf and I every once in a while I think, well, maybe I should just sell one. Yeah. Uh, but uh no, keep on your copies. I I signed most of them. Uh the the most valuable ones are the ones that I never sign. So um but anyway, the new one's coming and it's gonna be richer and more complete. Um I am looking for somebody to write a new forward uh right now for it. Jim Mars wrote the original forward uh the author of crossfire and the jfk assassination and the primary investigator on the 1897 aurora texas uh, crash case or event with the little alien um, there so that's uh been a big effort that i went through in the mid 2000s or so along with uh the seven um ufo crash retrieval symposium that were done in las vegas from um i think 2002 to 2008 um and that was uh that was very interesting um lots of people came to those and lots of uh names that are very common in the ufological world and on ancient aliens and so forth um, all were speakers at those crash conference from people like Rich Dolan or Stephen Bassett or Linda Howe or uh, less well-known people like Michael Schratt, but now more uh, well-known. Um, so I'm glad that at that moment in time, I could contribute to uh, ufology before life and children got in the way. Yeah. And, you know, the, the timing of the reprinting of the book, I think, is critical, actually, because right now we have the crash retrieval uh, subject, um, maybe for the first time ever being taken very seriously by the mainstream media and the public. I mean, I it's almost every week that there's like a mainstream article or video or, um, you know, something where the headline has to do with uh, recovered UFO technology. So. Uh, perfect timing on that. Uh, and for, for the people listening, there's there's been so many new people coming into the UAP field or UFO field uh, because of all the current events. So, you know, I'd like 
you to describe um, where does where does the name Magic Eyes Only come from? Well, that's a it's a great question, James. Um, it, it's the top secret code word, top secret magic, and uh, on several documents that have been leaked. Uh, uh, for example, in the Bowen manuscript, um, it, it's in right there in purple ink in original documents, which we've had forensically tested um, at the time frame. But it stands for Military Assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee, or MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C. And this was a 1947 um, document that basically created the the code word. Um, uh, and other terms, Majestic 12 or MJ-12, uh, have been used as well as synonyms for top secret magic or top secret majestic. I'm sure that the uh, the name may have changed um, today to something else or further compartmentalization uh, has gone on to get it into different buckets. So if you're talking about crashed hardware, it goes into a different code word. If you're talking about uh, hieroglyphic writing that was on the inside of a craft or a hatch or that goes in a different bug or psychic communications that occurred between um, participants that goes into a different categorization. It's, you know, it's the usual government compartmentalization that is the uh, the key approach. Yeah. Or biological, you know, material right. in another compartment. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's a, that's a very keen insight. Um, uh, yeah, real quick, just because you had mentioned it, um, 1897 Aurora, Texas UFO crash, because, you know, David Grush, um, you know, allegedly he's been cleared to talk about a few things and he talks about a 1933 Magenta Italy crash. Mm -hmm. Um, but when he was asked, are there crashes earlier than that? He indicates that there's at least one that's earlier than that. And I suspect it may, it, that might be one of the cases that he's referring to. Well, yeah, that one or the other one that's uh, highly credible is the 1941 Cape Girardeau, Missouri UFO crash um, in um, just outside of Cape Girardeau. And, and I was the primary investigator on that. And then Paul, uh, Paul Blake Smith took up the mantle and did more work on that and did another uh, whole book on that crash. But just to give you some, you know, there's a, a leaked Majestic document that talks about this uh, 1941 crash. And then, um, and, and Reverend Huffman, um, who the quick story is that he was a Baptist minister uh, on Main Street in Cape Girardeau, and he was called up by the police and, and asked to give blessings to uh, some some dead people. Um, and he was escorted in the police uh, car out about 15 minute drive or so to a field where he found three dead alien bodies um, and offered blessings. And then uh, the military showed up and asked everybody to be quiet. Um, and, and Reverend Huffman told his wife, uh, Flo Huffman, uh, all about this. And then ultimately, uh, on Flo's deathbed, um, told uh, her uh, daughter, or granddaughter, I think, uh, Charlotte Mann. Uh, and Charlotte Mann has given um, detailed testimony about this event as relayed through Flo Huffman. Um, and so you, you have, uh, that's a secondhand witness, but it's still very credible. Uh, Charlotte Mann is very credible and very interesting uh, in recounting exactly what went on uh, in this conversation, as well as the documents. And then I did more investigation, um, you know, uh, Cape Girardeau is the home of uh, Rush Limbaugh and Rush mm -hmm. Limbaugh's father. Um, and Rush Limbaugh's father was very much plugged in 
to the city council and political life in Cape Girardeau. Um, and um, once upon a time, in a radio interview, uh, Rush Limbaugh Jr. Um, was asked about this Cape Girardeau crash. And he, um, he winced a little bit and sidestepped and gave a subtle nod to, yeah, there's something there. Um, but ultimately, with all these crash retrievals, the core question is, when precisely did it happen, date and time? And where precisely did it happen? Um, and if you can nail those two things down, you can really get to the heart of the matter. Um, and well, once upon a time, uh, I was fascinated with this and, and had um, Michael Schratt, um, an aerospace historian, come and give a lecture um, about, um, actually it wasn't Michael, it was somebody else, uh, give a lecture about crashes and crash retrievals, airplane crashes. He was an airplane archaeologist. Uh, so he, he went all over the world looking at airplane crashes. And can you cover them up? Can you hide them? Can you sweep up all the material? Uh, and he gave the example of the Bakersfield um, stealth fighter crash before stealth fighters was announced. Um, that happened in Bakersfield, California. And he literally went to the crash site and went all over the place and brought all sorts of parts back. He, he was at the crash conference showing parts, you know, hey, this is a part of a stealth fighter that I found after the military, quote, cleaned it up. Yeah. And so the if anything gets shredded or destroyed uh, in a pr profound way with the UFO crash, there's often parts that have been left behind that the military hasn't gotten to. Yeah, and that is reminiscent of the um, planes of St. Augustine or Augustine uh, crash retrieval case where uh, Chuck Wade and uh, others had recovered um, parts, but um, it's now modernly known as the site where... Um, the religious professor uh, Diana Walsh Pasolka was taken with this NASA engineer who goes under the pseudonym Tyler D. We all know who he is. Uh, you know, out of respect for him, I'm not going to mention his name. Mm -hmm. um, and and Dr. Gary Nolan, who were taken to that site and they recovered uh, parts and they had to use a special metal detector that was designed by the NASA engineer because he knew what he was looking for. Hmm. Uh, and because the air force allegedly, according to this, um, NASA engineer, the air force had dumped a bunch of cans over around the site to confuse people, mm. uh, who did, who weren't the wiser to what to look for. And, you know, apparently this is, could have been part of a potential NASA legacy program. I don't know, maybe his, his, uh, part had more to do with contact, but, um, that's that's a case where you know people had gone back to and were doing digs and uh, looking for material and found some and some of those materials did seem to be uh, highly interesting. Now, well, yeah, and and fundamentally, people perceive that there is no physical evidence, and in reality, there's tons. There's I mean, there's arts parts, uh, right. which Linda Moulton Howe has, and uh, uh, Roger Lear had parts. People have implant pieces, um, and Chuck Wade, as you mentioned, uh, ha has has parts. Uh, so there's been many people that have done a variety of scientific explorations into uh, parts. I mean, the one that still seems to be most unusual is this layered bismuth magnesium yes. 15 angstrom um, thick. Nobody knows how to do it. Uh, it may have something to do with uh, electromagnetic field containment or manipulation. Um, so, or, or more speculatively, ultimately, some sort of biologic material interface. 
Um, right. I, yeah, I wanted to get to that a little, a little bit yeah. later with the potential interaction between recovered UFO technology and uh, psychic phenomenon, or yeah, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I did. I did want to bring up your book. Um, at least the original Magic Eyes only had a rating system. Yeah, yeah. Do you still have that rating system, and can you explain it for people? Sure. Yeah, that's a great, um, great question. So, um, it's a five point scale from you know low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, high, um, and and that score gets created through a couple of different um, metrics. Um, and they all have to do with the the authenticity of the um, the event. Um, so, if there are firsthand witnesses, you you get more points. Um, if there are you know multiple sources uh, for a particular event, you you get more points. Um, you know things like. Uh, internal consistency and credibility of the sources things like that that's that's really key um and then another category that my father and i dr bob wood um sort of discovered or enabled is what we call zingers yeah um those are really weird subtle facts that um nobody would remember how to fake so for example in the white hot report in majestic documents there's a description of a uh, a neutronic fusion or power plant basically a, a the power plant of the craft and it says a plastic like material similar to any 102 uh and and you say well what's any 102 and then lo and behold you can discover that yeah that's in the junkyards of sandia national labs in 1947 uh and you know it, it's nowhere in the modern science of when this was leaked in the the early mid 90s so there's things like that or in the special operations manual extraterrestrial entities technology recovery and disposal um that all talks about crash retrievals and how to pick the bodies up and where to send them and so forth. It's a typeset document and and there's uh, uh, Zs that are subtly raised off the line in the typeset. And that's a function of uh, the hot lead printing press. And you would never really understand or know that um, unless you were uh, looking at hot lead printing presses of the time. And this was long before um, Adobe InDesign, which used to be Quark Express, which used to be, you know, a glorified version of Word uh, back in the early 90s, you know. So it it's, those are just zingers. And you get extra points for zingers. Um, then the content is very interesting. You know, can you verify the content, the words that are there and so forth? Uh, and then the timeline, the chronology of, you know, does this document fit with other documents in the National Archives? Can you find, oh, yeah, this was signed by XYZ person. Is this their signature? Can you find examples of that um, in the National Archives? Are the dates right? Things like that. Uh, and then a big point is forensics. You know, do you have original paper? Can you do forensic tests uh, on it? And several of our documents, we have original paper. And you can, we sent it to uh, spec and forensic laboratories and had them punch out little holes and do uh, liquid chromatography and conclude that, yeah, this ink is uh, of this date and era, or this pencil mark is got a certain lead concentration and it's pre 1972, or, and you just go into that, you go into that FBI mindset. Um, and and try to look at those details and all that goes into the for the rating of how credible a crash case is and you know uh, with the, with that scale in mind um i'm just going to throw a number out let's say five 
Uh, do you have like a top five or or maybe the five cases that that hit the highest that hit the five point rating the highest mark um, or yeah. you know or you know in that ball you know three four whatever cases yeah. had the strongest um yeah I mean the the ones that come up in that are as Roswell naturally mm -hmm. uh Kecksburg Shag Harbor Nova Scotia um Braxton County West Virginia um uh, Aztec moved up um uh some other ones moved down in the new version um i think the uh the case of in uh, san antonio in 1945 by ramey baca okay uh, went down um because of the work of uh, doug johnson and myself uh but primarily uh, his investigation work about um the confabulation of the witness Ramey Baca and trying to get money uh, and trying to sell the story and not unable to verify lots of the core elements of the case. And so things like that went down. Um, in most cases, things how about, were... I was going to say, how about um, James Fox covered the moment of contact of Virginia? uh brazil case yeah because you had it, it it was in the original and it was uh, in the virginia yeah yeah the virginia um brazil 1996 right. yeah that's uh yeah 1996 uh, it was medium high i think yeah. it's still medium high uh as far as a, a case goes so uh yeah because i was going to say that i think in the in the you know, James Fox was able to get new witnesses on the, on the record, um, you know, anom anonymous uh, military, you know, and that's that's one of the really interesting things about that case is that, you know, Roswell so long ago that so many people passed away. But 1996 is, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. it's it's almost 30 years ago now, but it's still like current. You know? Yeah, well, that's that's a good input, James. I will uh, try to follow up with James Fox and get more more data. See, I'm sort of like herding cats. I mean, yeah, I'm course, not the yeah. primary investigator on all these cases, but I'm working with those people to try to get them to participate and uh, you know sh share their updated stories. Um, and but there's loads of opportunity to investigate further i mean most of the cases are sort of in the neutral zone yeah of, there's plenty of opportunity to keep investigating but realistically it takes real effort okay um, so this is something i wanted to get into but number one i wanted to, to say that um the book magic eyes only is it, it it was a necessary book so your the work is super important I can't overstate how important that book is and uh, how much I'm looking forward to this new edition because that had needed to be done. So now people at least have a list of like, you know, what, what's out there, what's available, kind of where is it at right now? Um, but you had mentioned in a, I don't, you know, an older lecture, maybe it's from 2008 or nine. I don't know. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you know, there are ways that you can investigate a crash retrieval case. So how, how could somebody go about doing that? Well, um, I'll give you some general ideas first, and then it often boils down to some specifics. Um, for, for, I mean, you basically have to look at every piece of information. What can you verify? Um, and uh, Peter Robbins and I went on a, um, a crash investigation into Tennessee one time. Um, and we had a lead and a uh, potential impact site. And so we, we went there and there was a giant pond there um, where we thought the crash site was. And so we talked to the owners and, and asked, well, how long has the pond been there? And, um, and got some information about that. And then you end up going to the county records and, and saying, well, who were the landowners uh, of, the, of the various pieces? Uh, and the, the history of that area. Uh, and then we, we had the theory of, well, you know, 
that if it was a crash of sufficient magnitude, um, maybe there would have been um, an earthquake recorded um, because it doesn't take much to trigger um, a seismograph. You know, a cow walking across a field is a minus two on the earthquake scale. And um, if you drop a car from like 30 feet, you know, you can get a, a one. Uh, and so the seismic network can sometimes tell you precisely when and where, or within reason, um, a, a potential crash. So that's an example of a, sort of a weird vector of investigation. Uh, most of my experience has been in the National Archives um, going to research these majestic documents. And that's what I've uh, focused on where, okay, we have a suspected document. It's dated such and such. Um, can we find other documents like it? Is the typeface right? Is the typewriter right? Is the formatting or the phone numbers right? Uh, what else can we learn about that uh, particular document and, and where it is, where it came from? Um, and, and that took us to a variety of different um, places in various different record groups in the National Archives. So um, my experience has been uh, mostly about research in um, National Archives and then some field work uh, like in the Cape Girardeau case, we um, got historical aerial photography out of the of out of uh, the National Archives. So you this crash happened in 1941 in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Well, I can get the 1939 overflight uh, from the U.S. Forest Service of the area, and then I have the 1944 overflight and. You send that off to a um, photo interpretation experts and show me all the differences in these areas so I can pinpoint what changed. And then you begin to pinpoint precisely where to go investigate uh, next. So that, that's another example of um, an investigation technique. Yeah, and in in the new print or edition, uh, what what are some of the uh, the new the newer cases that were added, and are they are they newer like um, chronologically, or 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 are they you know just cases well, you found good information on? Yeah, I think we expanded. Well, the, the last one in the book uh, is two thousand eight, and it's the needles. Um, uh, Nevada, California border, Laughlin um, uh, event that um, George Knapp did uh, a lot of investigation into. You know, there's still some debate as to, well, is this a crashed military uh, experimental vehicle that was rescued out or was it in fact extraterrestrial? But it was definitely credible enough to be in there uh, as a as a discussion. Uh, that's certainly one of the, that's one of the most recent ones. And then we also went a little further. You know, um, Nick Redfern uh, did a lot of research on um, the uh, three thousand BC um, Ark of the Covenant, uh, Mount Tararat. Um, you know, alleged uh, ET extraterrestrial vehicle and the CIA's work into that. And it's sort of an interesting, um, deep historical one, but, you know, it goes from 3000 BC to 1897. Um, and then there's a few more ones that are crash cases that get sprinkled in um, with sort of neutral credibility that come from Leonard Stringfield's uh, pioneering work uh, that I've built off of because uh, he was the original uh, crash retrieval uh, investigator, so to speak, 
uh, or consolidator bringing uh, all sorts of um, key crashes to people's attention. Uh, so there's some new ones there. Yeah, and an interesting note about um, you know developments in the research of crash retrievals. Yeah, a few colleagues of mine, um, Matt Ford and Christopher Sharp, did an article. It ended up being printed in the Daily Mail, and they talked about this uh, CIA office or directorate called the Office of Global Access, mm. where um, and it's under the Science and Technology Director. And, um, you know, allegedly this is a CIA um, group where they, they go and they retrieve stuff. And after, you know, in retrospect, it made a lot of sense because they would have international access. You know, that's what they do. Um, right. So uh, it the, uh, the CIA angle was especially interesting, um, especially because... Um, I know before before we started recording, I, I mentioned Zodiac, mm -hmm. and in the Zodiac article, it's funny. It says, and then you know, in the 1970s, the, the agency, the CIA, took total control over um, the crash retrieval program, and this is referring to Zodiac. And uh, I just I just found that as an interesting zinger, right? Yeah, right. It's just because this was printed in 1999, 2000, 2001, uh, mm -hmm. those the articles on Zodiac. And, you know, here we are 20 odd years later and it's saying something similar. Um, yeah. to, in your research, um, you know, through the, the MJ-12 and, the, you know, the mm -hmm. magic and uh, crash retrievals, has, has there been a significance with the CIA in in this you know crash retrievals in your research um well, yes yes and no um most of the leak majestic documents aren't cia although a few of them uh are and they have subtleties uh in the upper corner it says ER1-2735 or something, which stands for executive registry. So it's the, I think this was Hill and Coder was a, a director oh, of the yeah. CIA. Yeah. And you know, I believe it was his executive registry uh that maybe his office kept uh separately uh, as a as a tool. Um and and I did find you know other examples from the CIA um, of that exact handwriting and executive registry ER, but not of that particular uh, line item. It, it's missing or is non-responsive. Uh, and there at the National Archives, there's a, um, there's a couple, of, couple of computer terminals which have a um, huge collection of FOIA documents or released CIA documents that you can query. Um, but you, you can't request the whole thing because that creates a mosaic of understanding uh, that they don't want foreign intelligence people not to have. Uh, in general, there's not much information there directly from the CIA. It's more often that you find memos from the CIA within other um archive aspects. For example, if you go to the Truman Presidential Library, um, you can find memos from the National Security Agency, which isn't subject to FOIA, or you can find mm. su subjects uh, or memos from the CIA that may be of the time. Or if you, <laughs> if you go to uh, George C. Marshall's um, archive at the Virginia Military Institute and look at his um, daily calendar in 1947, you discover that the whole month of July is gone. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's almost like <laughs> there's missing records everywhere. Right. I mean, so you get to these key dates and times. Grant Cameron was notorious yes. for doing yes. this 
sort of work is to tune into the dates and times uh, of what's going on and discover, well, this stuff's missing. Well, who took it? Um, yeah. And uh, and why'd you take it? Um, yeah. And you don't get clear answers. Um, yeah, and, yeah, it's funny because uh, uh, Grant Cameron and, and Michael Shred are going to be on this week, I, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, you have um, like book the book dedication, right? I don't know if it's changed for the new version, but in the version I had, have it says this book is dedicated to people who have lost their lives for the sake of uh, UFO secrecy. So yeah. can you explain what you mean by that? Well, it's the same dedication for the next book, too. Um, and... It's really a tip of the hat to all the military personnel that were ordered to go do stuff and die. Um, and they died in some cases coming out sick as a dog from profuse bleeding of the nose and mouth and, you know, exposed to alien biologics that nobody understands or from radiation poisoning, or from uh, the post-traumatic stress and trauma of, of that. Um, it's surprising that so often the uh, church or churches or are involved in sort of debriefing or holding the hand or providing perspective, be it Reverend Huffman offering blessings to uh, Cardinal Spellman uh, being involved in um, the religious aspects of crash retrieval to my personal experience of going to Peterson Air Force Base uh, a few years ago and talking to the chaplain there um, about how to talk to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials and just sort of educating them about that. And so that, that's really what I, I meant. And I, I'm sure that there are so many more that have lost their lives uh, in their recoveries and the management of this. Um, I'm sure that the protocols today are much better and fewer people are inadvertently um, losing their lives. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's a uh, noble dedication and I'm glad it's going to be in the, the new version as well. Um, you know, I, um, I also wanted to ask you about the, uh, the, uh, advanced theoretical uh physics working group if uh um that john alexander and other people were involved with um mm -hmm. uh, and i i believe your father was involved with that group too as well right i'm i'm not sure of which i mean um advanced theoretical working group there's a code name for this do you have atp it? atp 10 Oh, um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that particular thing. But uh, what I will say is that my father um, was definitely involved in at, at McDonnell Douglas on yes. this anti-gravity research project. Because, you know, I was 15 years old when Stan Friedman came to dinner um, and talked about UFOs and he had a um, uh, a half million dollar project. Hold on a second. Um, it, Stan Friedman came to dinner, and um, and I sort of got exposed early to ufology. Um, and I know that he was working on trying to change the speed of light uh, with a Michelson Morley interferometer, and I ended up doing a senior project. Uh, in high school um, around trying to change the speed of light with uh, a high magnetic fields, um, which was a couple of characteristics of flying saucers. Um, and 
they, they did some interviews of um, abductees um, and tried to research a variety of the uh, the aspects of the phenomenon, you know, and this is 1970. Um, and I know that Hal Putoff has been interested all along on all sorts of various uh, physics things, as well as uh, many others. Um, but I think that's been one of my father's, um, I don't know, greatest frustrations is he never really got a chance to get plugged in any of the real data. Uh, well, that, you know, that's part of the speculation is, um, is if, if the advanced theoretical physics working group, which was, you know, everybody had clearances and it was a, you know, um, not an unofficial UFO working group. But they they named it that so it couldn't be FOIA'd or nobody can really find out about it. And, you know, the advanced uh, theoretical physics was, you know, kind of like a cover for UFO technology. And uh, I think what what's his name? Roger Blackburn uh, was there. Hey, Ron Blackburn? Yeah, Ron Blackburn. Ron, Ron Blackburn. And that, that makes more sense. The code I can't remember the code word that was for that group, but it was different than a, a tip, but it was. It was uh, Blackburn, Ed Dames. Yeah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, Al Putoff. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, I can't remember. Jack Houck. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, that that cluster. And oh, and John Alexander. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, when somebody wasn't there, my impression today is that these people were never cleared for any right uh, real data and it was you know it's a bunch of bright guys getting around the room speculating or thinking about how this might work or where she go and so forth um and uh um jack hauck is um a very it was a very interesting man who was very talented at uh spoon bending parties and yes, psychic yeah. research and uh um I think uh, I went to spoon bending party number two hundred ninety four. Would you Would you think of it? Well, it was it was it was fun. I mean, I got my spoon to bend a little bit, but I had to use a lot of force to. Yeah. Just some of the people that did, you know, some work. I'd say what was more impressive in that spoon bending world. My father went to uh, spoon bending party number two, uh, and Jack did three or 400. Yeah. Um, but one time I was in Pensacola, Florida at a MUFON conference and we were having dinner with like five or six people and Ed Dames was there and he took a spoon out and literally just spent, bent it with his mind. Yeah. In front of all of us. Yeah. And, and, and we went, holy shit. Yeah, that's skill or practice or psychokinesis, um, and it can be done. And I, I, you know, I've done it one time where it just bent like putty, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. And they said, you know, they looked at, at some of those spoons under a microscope, and, and you know, something was polarized in the in the yeah. metal. It, yeah, I think Jack responded that the. the the bonds were sort of slipped by each other. It, yeah. it didn't fatigue the way metal would normally fatigue um, and, and break. It's as if it was molded that way or grown that way or, or, or cast that way. Yeah. Um, but just really quickly to get back to that group. Um, if, it, if you remember that the, the code name of the group, other than that, then, then, because the, the one that's yeah. been shared by John Alexander in his book was the Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group. Uh, if you find another name, please let me know. Uh, yeah, I, but, I have to remember. I don't think I ever wrote it down. I mean, yeah, because it one doesn't person, really matter. Um, it was sort of it, a way of, of yeah. talking to each other at the time. Well, so, you know, uh, one of the attendees of that, uh, you know, I guess their notes leaked out, I guess. He, I don't know if he got them out or whoever, but uh, Oak Shannon, mm -hmm. uh, he's a gentleman who was there and his notes 
uh, came out. He uh, and uh, he confirmed that that's those were his notes mm -hmm. from the from one of the meetings at least. And uh, a name a name comes up, but you know they talk about reverse engineering number one, which so we know we're lo they're looking at reverse engineering. But the, the name affiliated with that was Bobby Ray Inman. Oh yeah, Bobby uh, Ray Inman. Yeah. This, and, um, I mean, I don't. I've never talked to Bobby Ray Inman. Um, I've heard of people that have or i want to say somebody like kit green has talked to him or um something i i don't know what to make of he sort of talks in code and lingo and it was unclear um uh, that's you know the Another book that I would love to do, um, but, you know, maybe somebody will take up the mantle and, and jump on it. And that is the um, the personnel, the personnel of Majestic 12 or the personnel of this field, uh, be it the historical figures. And then who today do you think is actually involved in, and why? Um, I mean, Henry Kissinger just died. Right. Um, and. Or senior pastor to his eyeballs. Years yeah. You know, and so now his papers, which were restricted uh, at the Library of Congress Manuscript Division, um, hopefully are now open that you could begin to better understand. Um, I tried to start a correspondence with uh, Kissinger, but it never, never happened. I, I mean, I, I sent him letters and but it, it, but he started his career in military intelligence um, in and around the time of of Roswell et al. Uh, and he, he was clearly in the loop. Um, yeah. And you know wh why does he go to China and uh, you know have have powwows with China or have this global statesman uh, skill? Uh, or reputation, um, because he can talk about UFOs and ETs with all those other high-level people and being not official government um, liaison in any way. Um, and China's got to have, Russia's got to have, yeah. um, and several of the countries have got to have um, material. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's been said by uh, Dr. Eric Davis. You know, he said that uh, all the superpowers of the world have their share of, you know, uh, crashes or recovered material. And there's certainly stories out there. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, are, did you did you hear the Bob Exler uh, discussion with Bobby Ray Inman? There was a no. phone. Yeah. So you know, Bob, I don't know if you recall Bob Exler. Or Bob Olschler, I don't know how you know you pronounce it. The NASA engineer, uh, he he was um, an investigator of the Gulf Breeze, right? Yeah, Gulf so Breeze. He ended up having a phone call with. He met Bobby Ray Inman at um, a science conference, like an official, like real duty science conference, mm -hmm. not a UFO thing. Mm -hmm. And he asked him about MJ twelve. And mm -hmm. Bobby Ray Inman gives him his car. Oh, no, no. Bob, I think, uh, gave uh, Bob <laughs> his mm -hmm. card. And uh, he ended up having a phone call with him sometime later. And he's asking him about uh, the reverse engineering program. So he didn't say UFO reverse engineering program, but that, you know, Bob Exler um, on his card, it has like an alien face thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's clearly they they know and he, and he mentioned mj12 and you know he he dropped some names saying you know i know so and so i want to mm -hmm. find out how it can help on this because you know he's a nasa engineer so he might want to offer some insight so this phone call happens and uh it's been leaked now it's been leaked and you know, here he is talking to Bobby Ray Inman, talking about a reverse engineering program, and is, is the technology going to be available? And Bobby Ray Inman's like, um, you know, ten years ago, I, I'd say no, but with you know the way things are going, 
it's possible that, you know, it might be more publicly available so they can work on the technology, Mm -hmm. you know, so they never explicitly state UFO in the conversation, but in the context, it's very clear what they're talking about. Right. It's just, I know that's another interesting, like a zinger, right? Like a really. Yeah. um, Well, I mean, there's also another um, gentleman in the Pacific Northwest, I'm trying to remember his name, who used to work at the NSA, wrote a book about his psychic communication with aliens and his role at the- Dan Sherman? Yeah, 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 Dan, Dan, yeah. Dan Sherman. If yeah. you got his number or you can connect me to him, please do, because I've been trying to get a hold of him. I think I do have it, but the, my data might be 15 years old or something. Right, I, but by all means, if you, you know. Yeah, I mean, Dan's an interesting- I mean, I found that to be a very, what I liked was, hey, I was there. I did this. I wrote a book about it. This is what was happening. And uh, that was powerful. I was going to have him at a crash retrieval conference talking about it. He he um, has his military forms in the book. Yeah. You know? I mean, this is, you know, I, I'd pull him before Congress. Yeah. You know, what is it? He's talk. got his DD-214 or, and. Uh, yeah, right. So he's he's not messing around, and there's no, yeah, no he, he definitely not, yeah, uh, and um, the technology aspect is the thing that potentially could lift humanity up. Yes, and and, and the consciousness, I think too. But yeah, right. Um, and what I've been working on, you know, for the past few years is is fusion. Um, and anti-neutronic fusion um, in a portable, small-scale way. And uh, this is coming out of um, some historical research that I've done um, into sort of lost technology. Yeah. Uh, Not necessarily alien technology, but maybe. I don't know enough yet about the history, but that's not really the point. The point is, you know, can you make low cost portable fusion that can drive the cost of electricity down by a factor of 10 to 100 right just the same way can you deliver me a you know three foot diameter uh gravity sphere or anti-gravity sphere that i can put on um aircraft or something to lighten the load well and yeah and there's speculation that um you know that accidentally came out in um in an airspace journal that was saying that the B2, you know, was essentially doing, uh, you know, it wasn't anti-gravity, but it was mass reduction. So that's, that's huge, right? You, right. That, oh yeah, that's right. Any, any sort of, I mean, any sort of mass reduction, which is a form of anti-gravity right. um, or, or, or exotic drag reduction, which is electrogravitics that work yeah. alone and so forth. Um if you can reduce the um, resistance on the wings through electrostatic methods, that's exciting. Uh, you can also reduce yeah. the drag on wings by heating it up. If you if you can make yourself fly through a 2000 degree bubble of hot air, um, you reduce the drag a lot. Um, and it's sort of analogous to the uh, faster than light Alicombri warp drive scenario where you you're in this bubble that's not faster than the speed of light, but outside the bubble it is. Um, yeah, and you know a few things to that is, you know, a lot of uh, you know speculation like how Putoff talks about space time metric, and uh, you know some of these objects when you try to co- record them look fuzzy because they're potentially in some kind of you know gravitational bubble. You know, and it's creating that distortion effect. Mm, you know, with, that's a good insight. Yeah, so uh, you know, that's that's kind of one one thing. And you know, I know Hal Putoff has talked about like blue shift and all these other interesting. Uh, he's he's got some good ideas. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, it's the blue shift and the red shift. I mean, yeah, those right. Things come and going. Um, I mean. One of the things that's in the Magic Eyes Only book and is so relevant to crash retrievals, which is this topic, is the uh, 
the extraterrestrial entities technology recovery and disposal um, manual, the special operations manual that was um, that was leaked in um, uh, 1994 from uh, the Quillen Pharmacy in La Crosse, Wisconsin, um, and it was you know, mailed to Don Berliner, and then subsequently my father got a copy and and retyped it. Um, and, you know, this is, it's really pretty clear cut, you know, uh, there's 11 areas that you ship this stuff to, um, you know, if you have aircraft, you ship it to a different area than, uh, an entirely intact device, uh, or a damaged device or a power plant or, um, fragments or supplies or provisions or a living entity, um, or a non-living entity uh, uh, and weapons. They have, you know, weapons called out that that's supposed to go to uh, Area 51 S4. Um, but Area 51 S4 is the predominant spot along with the Blue Lab at Wright-Patterson um, uh, Air Force Base. Um, did you, speaking of sort of current things, did you see, um the picture of the um Wright Patterson Air Force Base, I think it was the uh intelligence center office where they had a picture of a um a flying saucer on the wall along with a variety of other um accommodations and medals. It was clearly somebody's office. I don't know if I saw that picture. Yeah, it's on um Soul Soul Foundation, I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Website. It's like two thirds of the way down <clears throat> and you, you sort of scroll through it and you can, you, you see this, these pictures, it's clearly of um, somebody's office and you see pictures of stealth fighters on the wall and pictures of other um, rare known aircraft. And then you see a picture of a saucer on metallic uh, platform inside a warehouse. It, it clearly does not seem to be, you know, photoshopped or faked or anything because it's uh, it's a picture hanging on the wall and it's zoomed in a couple different ways. And um, I don't know, you can investigate that. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll out. take a look at it, that for sure. I thought it was interesting in that for the first time, I really saw something that looked like, oh yeah, we really have one. I don't know if it's captured or we built it ourselves. Right. Yeah. And, you know, some of the comments that were made both by uh, David Grush and by Dr. Eric Davis had been that some of these objects had been crashed and or landed. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah, that's uh, definitely there's plenty of landing cases. I mean, I, when I was making Magic Eyes only, um, I just focused on crashes. I mean, right. There are loads of high quality uh, landing cases with, um, you know, human interactions. Um, I, I decided early on that I was going to specialize in only two things, uh, crashes and documents. Yeah. And that was it. No, I'm interested in abductions and experiences and experiencers and the whole milieu of other aspects. But lights in the sky didn't do it for me yeah um, and i just said you know it's all about the hardware on the ground and the bodies um and uh and that sort of brings up i i did put together another new book called the ai yeah, yeah. ufologist yes and it's now available on amazon and um I, I tried to focus on the, the big questions of ufology in my mind. Um, and then I got increasingly nuanced from, you know, well, what's the agenda? Why do they care? You know, what are the national security issues? How, how, how should the government tell the truth about this? Um, to, you know, what sort of technology advances uh, are possible to even more nuanced things like, uh, uh, you know, how do you uplift humanity uh, with 
what what sort of technologies that might be linked. But an earlier question that you brought up, uh, sort of how do you elevate humanity? I mean, is is anti-gravity a choice? Is fusion a choice? Is increased psychic power a choice? Right. Um, those sorts of things, um, it, along with, you know, why why are they hiding uh, the truth? And even as somebody yeah. who's familiar with the UFO field and, and thought about it for a long time, I was amazed that, like, at least 30% of the answers I got from AI um, were, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. It was surprisingly uh, informative. Um, let me let me let me find a, a a complex question just to give you a a sense of of that. Um, um, well, I'll I'll leave you the last question in, in the book, um, and it, it's probably one of the most. It's a little long winded, but with AI, you sort of have to give it enough context to think about the answer and it give you a good answer so i'll read it <clears throat> i said it says what are the five main forces that are interconnected driving global challenges how are government debt economic forces affecting this how is the political and societal polarization of the left and right mindset and actions influencing our future Compare and contrast the geopolitical attitudes, policies, and priorities of countries, particularly the U.S., China, when it comes to the planet's future evolution. Addressing climate change and mitigation costs will be a major global expense. How should equitable cost sharing be devised? Technology progress in CRISPR, artificial intelligence, energy, biological sciences are all key enablers for a more peaceful planet with less war, inhumanity, and poverty, all within the alien context. Um, so that's a mouthful uh, to answer, but in the subsequent eight or nine pages, it did a good job. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's that's an example of a super sophisticated question, but you know, the on the other end of the spectrum, everybody wants to know, well, why are they here? What are they doing? You know, um, how many different races are they? Um, but in the end, nobody's going to give a shit unless you can make money. Yeah. And I know it yeah. sounds really crude. Yeah. Um, but unless there's an economic advantage to somebody. I, mean, I think there's, I mean, I think there are a ton of incentives to do it. Um, doesn't mean it's easy, but at, at the end of the day, number one, it's necessary. You know, yeah. Um, you know, we might be on a, some kind of timetable. We might as well do it while we have the chance. Uh, mm -hmm. And here, you know, both of us are, are, are citizens in the United States. Um, so, I mean, I, I prefer that we did it before another country did it, you know, especially China or Russia or, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just, there's just so many reasons to do it. It's, it's, I think it greatly outweighs, especially nowadays, compared to maybe in the nineteen forties and fifties. You know why why it should be done, and yeah. I I think that uh, even within this magic group, that uh, a number of them, at least the newer people who are in the program, agree with that because I, yeah. I think that's part of why we're seeing what we're seeing unfold is because some of those people are for some level of transparency. Yeah. I mean, that's another book that I, that I, or another question I answer in the AI ufologist, you know, what is oh, the functions, man. what is the functions of the M, of MJ-12? What are the pros and cons, the advantages of disclosing or not disclosing? Um, and I guess my take is that there never will be complete disclosure. There may be partial disclosure and it's the, because the ultimately the humanity is not ready for it and the ETs aren't willing to support it or give it. Um, and it, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's a rabbit hole. You, you know that yeah. it's super no, complex. Yeah. It, it's, 
I mean, uh, Richard Dolan's uh, After Disclosure yes. uh, book yeah. is is just a deep dive into the conundrum yeah. of telling the truth, um, and uh, and the dangers. I mean, the majority of the world believes that ETs are real. Um, the question is, well, okay, we've had crash parts. Well, have you reverse engineered them? Do you have you got anti gravity? You have you you basically you're going to rewire and massively upset the economic apple cart of the globe. Um, yeah, and that's the problem. Um, you have to do it slowly, um, but we got to get rid of the hydrocarbons because the climate change is really happening. Um, and you, do you, you, do you do think it's been them. happening slowly? What? You know, the, the, the disclosure, like, do you think oh, the that... disclosure? Um, yeah, I'd say yes. I mean, if you look at the trajectory of, of, um, movies, TVs, advertisements, um, over the past 30 well, e years, even leaks, right? I mean, how many of those leaks were intentional, right? And well, that's a great question. Um, in the case of the special operations manual, uh, the, it was clearly intentional. Right. Um, but was that a case, consensus or was it a rogue, you know? Uh, like... I think it was a rogue, rogue person. Yeah. Um, and in the case of uh, Thomas Cantwheel and and Tim Cooper and, and the various majestic documents that came from that trove or, or pathway, um, I think that was, again, a ban on dying of cancer, thinking the truth should be out, sort of a lone wolf. Um, and the same thing with the Eisenhower briefing document as undeveloped film to Jamie Chandra. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, again, lone wolf. Uh, I wrote a whole paper on psychological warfare in the Majestic documents, which is... Is it um, on your website? The Magic Eyes Only? Um Psychological warfare. Papers? Yeah. Um don't think so. Uh, but it's gonna be in the new book. Um and Magic Eyes Only? Yeah, the new Magic Eyes oh, Only nice. will have a chapter on psychological warfare and the majestic documents. Super important. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and the bottom line is that. Any psychological warfare effort has to have a specific purpose in mind. Yeah. So it's a marketing problem. If you think of it that way, it's like, I want to tell you the truth again and again and again and again. And then I want to slip you a lie. And I want you to believe the lie. Yeah. And that's what psychological warfare is about. Yeah. And these leaks that have occurred only attract a massive amount of attention from foreign spies. Right. Well, what you you leak the special operations manual into the public domain, and you think China or Israel or France or any of our other allies say, oh, shit, we need to get our spies into Area 51. Yeah. Um, and we have to put on a long-term program to go pursue that. And you think China hasn't been doing that? Right. Um, I'll give you one example. It's just sort of color. Um, I was at the Association of Former Intelligence Officers um, in San Francisco in like 1998 or something like that. And the FBI guy came in as part of counterintelligence and was giving a talk um, to all the people who were there. And you can join as an associate member, not that I'm in a, an intelligence officer or anything. Yeah. Um, and he asked the audience, well, how many people do you think are spies in Silicon Valley? Yeah. This is 1998. Um, and a few people said, oh, 10, 15 or something like that. He said, no, it's about 400. Yeah. And now I wouldn't be surprised if it's two, 3,000. And they're embedded in companies at Intel and uh, 
Oracle Microsoft, or yeah. all over the place, um, either stealing for money or just feeding things back or it's industrial espionage um and they're they're trying yeah and uh yeah i i'm I'm really looking forward to reading that chapter because i think i think that's so critical for the context for people to understand the dynamic of uh documents leaks uh you know the real information had the relationship between ufos and psychological warfare uh it's it's really i think important to, to having a clearer understanding of what's been going on the last you know 80 years or so well, um I'd say the government's approach to ufology in general is to ignore and discredit and and anytime in the past um people were more draconian let's throw james forrestal and defenestrate him out the window right um, i was going to ask that about your dedication too yeah. You, yeah uh so that happens in the in the 40s and and maybe you know into the 50s or 60s where people are um witnesses are silenced but nowadays they don't have to do that they just um discredit the people or yeah. find or confiscate the evidence it's more or, sophisticated yep yeah, because it caused too much attention to make people yeah. disappear. Yeah. Right. And actually, one of the things I, you know, talking about investigations, um, how do you investigate a crash retrieval? Uh, in the Kecksburg case, uh, I ended up using a remote viewer to ask nice. for yeah. evidence. Where's evidence associated with uh, this crash? And it, the data came back that... Uh, the photographer that was there had effectively palmed one of his rolls of film away. And when they took his camera and took his film, they got nothing, but he, he still had a roll of film. And later on, I traced him down and his demise um, as he was uh, run off the road in Southern California on Highway 101 in Ventura, um, and then bludgeoned to death. Um, and the coroner's report and getting that and reading it, um, and the toxicology report that suddenly went missing. Uh, so it's just, you know, when you dig in, you suddenly get this back of the neck problems um that if you really were an fbi agent you'd go oh well it's more work to do yeah well uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the remote viewing aspect um because uh, you know at a, at a conference i was part of this past weekend we had paul smith and he was uh oh, yeah. talking about uh you know the remote viewing program and you know how the ufos come up and you know we had questions as to, you know, did did the remote viewing program or remote viewers ever use that ability uh, to understand UFO technology um, and also to find crash retrievals or any kind of information or, or of course, uh, communication with non-human intelligence. So th those are all, you know, I, I'd love to have you on another time to discuss those angles because I believe... Um, your your father talked about a remote viewing program or something like that based out of the McDonnell Douglas. Well, I'm not sure that's true. He wrote a whole article in the MUFON Journal about his his anti gravity work. I know that uh, you know I did some work with Ed Dames on on psychic stuff um, long long time ago uh, in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, but as far as I know, I I know that um, Joe McMonagall, one of the original Stargate yeah. uh, people, uh, it did, you know, remote viewing targets that turned out to be uh, UFOs. Um, it's a, I don't think the remote viewing works by a tasker giving you a task or yeah. a target. And you go do the work. Um, 
And so if the tasker doesn't know what it is, um, you know, you get, sometimes you get normal answers and sometimes you get an uh, ET answer. So it's, yeah. it's well, and that's hard to validate too. I know, you know, uh, Ingo oh, yeah. Swan's penetration oh. or he talks all about that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, just, um, for the audience listening, because uh, you know it, it's a true honor to to be able to speak to you. Uh, you know, I, I greatly appreciate uh, your time. I greatly appreciate your work, your father's work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I hope people, uh, after watching and listening to this, go look up even the old stuff. Uh, you know, of you and your father's lectures and the yeah, website. Well, yeah, MajesticDocuments.com has all the Majestic documents on there, as well as uh, my website on Magic Eyes Only uh, will be updated with when that's available. And the, the AI Ufologist is available on Amazon um, right now, which is which is great. And I, I appreciate the opportunity, James, to talk uh, about it and... Um, share some insights. I will be speaking at the um, July MUFON conference in uh, Dallas um, next year. Yeah, they, they should have you at a contact in the desert or something. Well, I know I, I've been out of the program or the efforts yeah. uh, for quite some time because I've been busy running my companies and trying to make uh progress because fundamentally i've long recognized that ufology is broke and that without significant influxes of capital you cannot really make any real hard progress yeah um, and so i've been on that task for a while yeah so, so uh you know i hope to have you on again sometime i'd love uh, to you know it's, it's an honor speaking to you so you take care and keep up the great work and everybody look out for Magic Eyes Only and also um, the AI book, which is on Amazon. So take care.